13 is all about the senses. So when we think of senses, typically we think of your five senses. But these senses are based on receptors. Remember that receptors are bringing information in toward our central nervous system. These, sen these receptors can be divided into certain classes. For example, a thermoreceptor. Thermo has to do with temperature. It tells you that your coffee's too hot. Photo has to do with light. That's gonna be your eyes receiving information. A nocio receptor has to do with pain. Chemo is chemical. So these receptors will detect different chemicals. Mechano, mechanical. So these are gonna have to do with feeling, like the sense of touch primarily. There's also some sensory modalities. For example, how do you know that your arm is bent at a 90 degree angle? Well, that's a proprioception. That's your body position. Or if you're trying to learn a new movement, that has to do with kinesthetics or this idea of kinesthesia. A visceral reaction is one that's in your gut. So these are more autonomic, but they have to do with things like your digestive system. And somatic sensation is your body. Like what kind of things do you feel? Like for example, you can feel light pressure or deep pressure. You can feel vibrations, itches, pains, temperatures, and even your hair moving. So let's move to another sense, the sense of taste. So I think of it like gustatory has to do with like eating with gusto. You really enjoy what you're eating. So think of like gusto, gustatory taste. On your tongue, you have these little uh, projections called papillae. There's four different kinds that you can see there. And then when you're tasting, there's five different flavors. And when you taste something, it is a combination of temperature, but also a combination of these flavors. Textures are also playing a role, but the flavors that you can pick up on your tongue are going to be chemoreceptors. So these are chemicals, the salty taste, they're sweet. Unami has to do with a, a beefy kind of meaty flavor. Um, savory, sour and bitter. So here's a picture of your tongue and you can see these raised projections and what they look like and how they're a little bit uh, different from each other. Another sense that you have is olfaction. I think of it like an old factory, smelling an old factory. That helps me remember olfaction has to do with your nose. And definitely your nose and your um, taste buds are very connected because they're both chemical receptors and they're in a very similar area. A lot of times you're smelling and it's the chemicals of the smell that you're actually detecting and thinking about for taste. Olfactory cells or these cells that have to do with your uh, smell are just the dendrites that are extending into the surface of your nose and nasal cavity. Humans have a high capacity for smell, um, maybe not as much as like a dog, for example, but it's significant. Uh, humans, in fact, humans can outsmell dogs in certain areas, but not in all things. But basically, these airborne uh, molecules called odorants, that's where we get the word odor, these odorants are stimulating these dendrites in your nasal cavity, sending that information to your olfactory bulb, which is located in your brain. And it's part of the limbic system. We'll find out more about the limbic system later. But the limbic system has a lot to do with memory, which is why smells can often trigger uh, memories. A third sense is hearing. Hearing just means a vibration of your eardrum. That's going to be done by sound waves. Sound waves cause that vibration. The nerve endings pick up the vibration from your eardrum and interpret it. Sound waves that are very low and they don't peak very dramatically have to do with low um, have to do with pitch and volume. So here you have a very a soft volume and a very low pitch, so it's down here. The auditory canal collects these sound waves. The auricle is going, the outer ear is going to send it into that canal. It's going to vibrate the tympanic membrane. We call that your um, eardrum. Four, five, and six are the smallest bones in your body. They're going to take those vibrations, transmit them to the cochlea, where you have these little projections that detect 
those vibrations. They're sent then down, they're sent down the vestibular nerve to your brain, where your brain can interpret those sounds. Notice how the eustachian tube connects your ear with your throat, or auditory tube. It connects your ear with your throat. So that swallowing sometimes can equalize the pressure on the inside of that tympanic membrane with the outside. The fifth sense to consider are your eyes. This diagram shows what some of these different features are in your eyes. But the key here is to recognize that light is going to pass through the cornea and then through some of this uh, liquid. Then it's going to pass here in the, through the pupil. Now, the iris is going to adjust the amount of light that can enter through the pupil. But once that light goes through the pupil, it's passing through the lens then, where it'll get uh, flipped over. The image is projected onto the retina, which is the back of your eye. That image gets taken to the back of your brain. The back of your brain is the occipital area of your brain, which then uh, flips the image back over, writes it back up as you interpret uh, that image. You have some interesting things in your retina. Uh, rods, for example, help you see at night. They're more like light sensitive cells, whereas cones are a specific cell that has to do with color and detecting uh, different types of color. Notice the difference in the lenses when you're focusing far as opposed to focusing close. Often if a person is far-sighted, that means they can see far but they can't focus close. That has a lot to do with the muscles around your lens that will adjust your lens or aren't adjusting them uh, properly. Similarly, if you're nearsighted, you can see close but you can't see things that are distant or blurry. And again, it has a lot to do with your lens shape because of the way that the lens can no longer focus very well. Astigmatism means you can only really see in the one plane. It, you have a hard time seeing uh, depth. Whereas hyperopia, that's the term for farsightedness. Myopia has to do with nearsightedness. So sometimes people say, oh, that's so myoptic. Well, it just means that that person is nearsighted. Not often physically, but sometimes metaphorically, they can't predict what's happening in the future very well. The information that has to do with senses is going to be processed in your brain by the primary somatosensory cortex. Cortex just means the outer part. So this outer band of your brain is going to focus mostly on how do you interpret senses. You can see in the picture here, this kind of deformed looking character, and what it's showing is that you have certain areas of your body that have a lot of nerve endings and you have a lot of area of your brain that's meant to interpret it. So this blue diagram is showing the sensory part, the part that's really good at sensation. The yellow is showing the motor response, the part that's really good at coordination. But just sensory, sensing the information, you have some areas of your brain that are dedicated to the hypersensitive areas, like your hands or your lips have a lot of sensation, whereas your knee and your elbow might not have as much sensation uh, dedicated to it. You also have areas in your brain that are association areas. So just like you have a somatosensory area for sensation, you have an auditory area that has to do with interpreting sounds. You have a visual area in the back of your brain that has to do with interpreting color and shape. But you also have association areas. So it's more than just colors and shapes, but recognizing what those colors and shapes are, that that's your car, for example, in the parking lot. And it's not just like sensing that you feel something with your thumb, for example, but then processing that with an association area. Is that a pleasurable sensation or a painful one? It's not just auditory, a section of your brain that interprets sounds, but is that sound pleasant? Is it music or is it noise? So you have association areas that help you uh, put some of those pieces together. Sometimes you have senses that just need a very quick response. That's a reflex. So a reflex doesn't require a lot of conscious processing. 
but it does require stimulation. For example, you tap your knee or you touch something hot. Uh, reflexes then are a very quick response. They only go to your spinal cord typically and back. They're involuntary. If you touch something hot, your hand is moving away before you can even think about it or stop it. And they're predictable. So every time you tap the knee, you expect the leg to kick out. Here's an example of how a reflex arc works. Notice you have the patellar tendon is being tapped. That's going to cause the quadriceps to contract. But why? The afferent nerves are going arriving at the spinal cord. The efferent nerves are exiting the spinal cord and causing that muscle to contract even before it processes in your brain that your leg is kicking out. These reflexes are uh, rapid and automatic and they have a lot to do with helping you out in terms of things like your posture, maintaining your posture. That would be a stretch reflex because it has to do with keeping your uh, muscles contracted as opposed to a pain reflex arc which only goes to your spinal cord and it withdraws, it keep it withdraws, it's moving things away from that painful stimulus. That's all for chapter 14.